Hello and welcome to another episode of Bare Bones Wargaming, a show with no bells, no whistles, no frills, just a man, a camera, and his game. This episode, I'm going to give you just a little, um, how should we say it, I guess, taste, get our feet wet kind of thing, a little preview, there's the word, preview of my solo method that I'm trying to design for the classic game, Flat Top. Designed by S. Craig Taylor, originally published by Battleline, and of course this version is the one published by Avalon Hill Games. Uh, basically, as most of you know who watch my channel, I've been working hard at work trying to get a solo method put together. And um, it has been a lot of work, but I feel like now, having kind of started this Coral Sea situation here, uh, I feel like I've got things moving along nicely. Now, how it's all going to play out here eventually, we'll have to wait and see. So what I thought I'd do with this video is just kind of show you the setup, what I'm doing, uh, kind of go over things a little bit, and all this is posted on Board Game Geek in a thread uh, that I started on the flat top page uh, under the Variants uh, tab there, if you're looking for it. So, basically, the idea here is using the framework of the classic flat top game of course but adding some changes to it now the changes I made are a couple here so let's kind of work our way through a sequence of play because I actually changed the sequence of play a little bit too the weather phase I haven't touched the weather phase weather phase is just like it is in the game wind directions the clouds all that I, I left alone submarines now there are submarine counters what I did very simply is because submarines did play a big impact, although it was few and far between in the Pacific Theater, but, you know, sunk the Wasps, sunk the crippled Yorktown, um, those kind of things. So, I have represented them here, very simply, and again, this may change the frequency yet, I'm still waiting to see how often this pops up, but each turn, at the beginning of the turn, after the weather phase, I'm rolling dice for both the Japanese and the US naval forces and if I roll 11 or 12 that's a possible submarine attack then I pick my target and then I roll again a 2 or a 3 actually they're hit and then record damage uh, via the flat top uh, combat tables so so far I've only had one possible submarine attack uh, the Japanese and playing the scenario which started at 0100 and I'm on the 0600 turn right now so, and it wasn't even close, to be honest, on that. So, uh, that's the submarine things. The shadowing phase, the big thing with the shadowing phase is I have left it independently because I think it's important to have it there. And then if, you know, you lose your shadow, as it were, you have a chance to reacquire. However, I have changed the range of die rolls, and I'm using 10-sided dice for a lot of these things. Um as well as the six-sided dice that are used for combat and things of that nature. Um, but the one thing that I've noticed from reading a lot lately and studying things is how difficult it was to shadow in 1942 and also the, the prevalence, which surprised me, um, of how often that the snoopers, you know, as the, as the naval participants described them as, how often they were shot down. Uh, as they tried to shadow task forces. So it becomes a lot harder um, in my version to shadow because it just was, in my opinion, based on my reading, especially at Lundstrom's work, uh, very difficult to do. Okay. Task force movement, I haven't really changed that at all um, in terms of movement. Now, what I have changed is this. So let me zoom in here a little bit. Let me show you what I've done. What I've kind of done is taken the idea from the classic carrier game which came out in 1990 uh, that game well I've done videos on it so you can look back at my videos and see that but you can see here I've got some mystery units uh, I've done anywhere from one to four potential mystery units as it were uh, these ones also have two more over here because if you know anything about the Battle of the Coral Sea originally the Japanese plan was to come down let me zoom back out here a little bit whoops wrong direction was to come down south of Guadalcanal and then sweep through here and check to see if anyone was coming up from Australia and then hook um, a sharp left across here 
and basically search to see if anybody was over here um, in the southern approaches to the Port Mosbury route. Now over here, I also have um, some units with the Shoho. Those are the blue ones, okay? And when I'm doing this, what I have done, I'm gonna move you again here, just to show you. What I have done is assigned each task force, after creating it, a dye color. So you can see there I got a blue one, I got a black one, I got a red one. I don't have one for the task force that's the invasion force because that one's kind of easy, so to speak, to remember. But these ones here correspond to what you just saw on the map. So the three black ones are for the Shikoku group, the three blue ones are the Shoho, which was supposed to be the covering force, and then of course the other three are the Zuyoho, um, or the Zuikaku, sorry, that was also part of that as well too. So that's how I match up the colors, and of course I use the Roman numerals to differentiate from Arabic numerals, which of course are used for the strikes. Uh, and some limited searches. More about that in a second. So that's what I'm doing there with those guys. And incidentally, um, let me show you this too. Let me come back out. Uh, I'm also using these excellent, excellent charts that were made by Bore and posted by Board Game Geek member um, Blockhead, who is very much into flat top as well too. And I really do. Let me zoom in on this little cockroach in Chicago here. I really like these as replacements for the tiny little charts that you have with the original game. But you can see here, like with the Shikoku, what I've done is, and I've cannibalized from other games, uh, if you notice the variety of different counters that I've pulled, uh, quite frankly, it's just because my eyes are having trouble reading not only half-inch counters, but the color scheme. The color scheme is brutal, in my opinion. At least for me, it is. You know, it may not be for everybody, but I've gotten away from that. So not only have I done this with using strength points and then matching up with a different kind of, of air units, but also if you look over here, like at Rabul, I just basically have made my own markers with just the letter of the aircraft and then um, the strength value of it. I've done two sides, ones and twos and threes and fives, and then of course you can make change as applicable but if you're into flat top these charts are great uh, i really really like them so definitely kudos to uh, blockhead for making those because it does make things uh, very easy organizing now you can also see that it takes up a lot of space too but you know it's like most things in life there's always a trade-off nothing is perfect okay so i move these forces like they're real um, their movement allowance that they're that they're eligible for one or two hexes depending on the force and then kind of work from there now the big change that i made was i've created an action cycle which is basically based on a chip pull system so at the beginning of the action cycle each player rolls a die high die gets to choose the starting chip from the company all the other chits go in the chits are for the task force that have planes that can be launched and searched and the same thing for bases now bases of course uh, in the game qualify for scouting now even if they don't you don't have any strength points on them what i did was i abstracted again based on the search parameters ranges scale that's used in carrier for the carrier forces in this game and then I went for the land-based air, and with the exception of a few planes that hit, can stay in the air for a long time. The American side, the Catalinas, on the Japanese side, Emily's and Mavis aircraft. I basically averaged them together uh, in terms of how far they can move every single turn. And now I've made a range from each base. So when the base is activated, uh, or the carrier force is activated, then you count out from there. The first thing you do with that activated force is you search. And then you see, do you find anything? And then I have three levels uh, of intelligence when it comes to uh, locating and finding things there with that. So uh, so that takes a lot of counters out of the game for the land-based search, searches now. Um, because before I had like a billion counters all over the place. And of course you can see here at the map that there's still quite a few counters but not as many as there was when I was flying planes uh, everywhere. Um, speaking of planes and launches and stuff, 
Then after you do your searches, then you do your error operations. So I move the error operations phase to coincide with the chip pull phase. So you do your ready factors, your launches, all of that. And then of course, then you do your error movement. And at the end, if your error movement results in combat, then you do your combat. The combat system is exactly the same as it is um, in the original flat top. I didn't change anything with that. One thing I am doing, and I'll just pass this along, and of course, you know, this is, um, you know, for what it's worth, your mileage may vary kind of thing. But what I did was I bought a couple of dry erase boards, and rather than using the sheets that come in the game, uh, I've just made short little things here to describe where the planes are coming from, what uh, unit identifies them, whether they're a cap, when they took off, when they landed, and who the planes are. Now, in the event of more than one plane being launched, type of plane, I should say, being launched from a base, then I did something like I this strike I launched from Australia here. I have the time recorded, and then the, down, the, the return time, time you have to come home, so to speak, for each one, and then have it here, like Hudson's and 26's, and then their um, counter, which identifies them on the map. So... Uh, I just like it. I find it easier, quite frankly, especially since I'm doing the chip pull, because unlike the original flat top sequence of play, when you do your air operations, you're not doing everything all at once. And part of the reason I instituted the chip pull was the game turns are one hour, but let's face it, you know, everybody is not going to be on the same pace. Somebody may have launched sooner than others, later than others. Somebody may have radioed in. Somebody may have thought they radioed in. Somebody else may have thought they passed the information on to somebody else. I, quite a few times I've read both um, Midway and Coral Sea about how the U.S. carrier commands didn't share intel information, um, sightings and stuff, because they assumed the other carrier group had actually picked up the same transmission, which, you know, is kind of mind-blowing, but again, they were uh, very touchy about radio silence, so they couldn't be found. But again, that's another factor that I built into the chip pool that, hey, you know, just because the Yorktown knows that, hey, their search planes have found something, there's something here, um, you know, whatever it is for mine, level one, two, or three, level one's like, hey, dude, I think something's here. Level two is, yeah, there's some ships, but I'm not sure exactly the composition yet. And then level three is, dude, there are ships here, and I have a good idea what they are. Um, so basically, as you go forward, you can decide whether to launch your strike. Um, and of course, for the U.S. player, the solo player, having the three different forces there gives some ambiguity, because you could launch the strike, but in the time that that strike's taken off, when you search the other forces, you may find that, hey, Roman numeral two I had a level one contact, and it seemed like, yes, there's potentially something there, and I took a gamble, but in the meantime, hey, Roman numeral one of the same color group, dude, I got a level three sighting. That's the real one. Um, and as soon as a level three sighting is found on a unit, you eliminate the other one. It's kind of like um, the same thing in Carrier when you draw a dummy counter and realize that force no longer exists, you get rid of it um, with that. So, Because it is interesting to me. Um, toward the end of the Battle of the Coral Sea, uh, where they thought for sure the day after all the action was over on May 9th that they had found another force, and then another pilot went up to investigate who had a little more experience, and he was like, dude, I'll go shadow it, even though it's probably going to be dangerous. We're getting at maximum range. And when he got out there, it turned out to be a reef, basically. And the reef was making little uh, waves and wakes in the ocean that looked like the wakes of a combat force sailing. Uh, um, on the water so you know it, it is interesting and since you know carrier basically or flat top is basically based in 1942 uh, I'm trying to get this played by 1942 standards if you will so that's part of the reasoning I did the chip pull uh, activation so you do all those things and then the repair step remains the same nothing there so let me just walk you through real quick here again it's just like a little preview let me walk you through um, Rabul which I just pulled the Rabul marker here um, and all I did for my markers real simple nothing fancy is I just put a letter on and then you know put it into my um, uh, my pull my container and and drew it so the first thing you do is you would check for searches. Do the scout planes from Rabul that were launched 
find anything. Now for the Japanese, interesting thing is their land-based air actually was much shorter um, than the carrier-based planes that they had. The Japanese did have an advantage carrier-based as far as range went, but uh, land-based, interestingly enough, when I did all the averages together, it turned out to be less, basically seven hexes a turn as opposed to nine hexes a turn for the US ones. So here's our bowl way up here. So this is the opening turn, this is the beginning. So we're just gonna count seven hexes out, one, two, three, four, five, six, and seven. And then of course, since we're suspecting that things are here, it would be within an arc of area there that you would do the scout. And again, the scouting planes don't exist, they're abstracted here. And I am, um, I am being a little flexible so to speak, with that, by not using air units that are actually counted in the game. I don't count them against them. But again, it's to simplify the system so that the solo player doesn't get overwhelmed with like half a billion things to do, because there's enough record keep keeping in flat top to begin with. So, Rabul doesn't have anything with that, so then I would go over here to the Rabul chart. And I would start my air operations, which, let's see if I can zoom in a little bit better there. Now let's come out just a little bit, okay? So as you can see from the previous turn, I was getting some planes ready. And again, you know, these charts are great. Ready factors, color-coded to show you the launch factors and how much movement you're going to get for each unit. That's, that's totally awesome. So I'm launching some Mavises here, and I'm launching some Nels. All together, and again, I'd arm them just like in the regular flat top game with GPAP torpedoes, uh, however, you want to arm them. That hasn't changed at all. I haven't changed the combat um, portion of things at all. Okay, mm, excuse me. So, I've got oh, excuse me again, pardon me. I got six, seven, eight, eight launch factors, which is just at the end of normal here on the yellow scale. And again, I would just take my hand dandy whiteboard here and just mark it all down with the name of the base, a big old R for Rabul because there is no other base. It's O600 I'm launching everybody. And again, I'm using the charts from Flat Top. That hasn't changed at all. So I'm using the ranges for Mavises and Nels. So the range factor for Nels is 8, so 6 8s are 14. Nels have to come down then. And then, of course, the Mavises are the ones that can stay up far ever. Um, and they basically can stay up till 0500 the next day because they have a range factor of 23. That's insane um, when you think about it that way. Okay. And again, since I'm using the dry erase board, the other thing that's nice is that I can just go ahead and reach inside my cup here with all my little markers to designate um, the the air operations chart which I'm using from the original game and then I just pull them at random because I just need one for nil and then I need two for the Mavises because I'll send them on two different routes because again because of the range that the, the I should say the endurance more uh, how long that they can stay in the air that's why I chose to go ahead and do that Okay. So I'm going to mark the Mavises down here with a 17 and 19 for their air operations marker, and then a 25 for the Nels. So I'll move these guys over as soon as I get a hold of them. Ah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Whoops. Keep moving on me. So 25 on the Nels, there they are, and then the Mavises are 17 and 19. They're going to be flying from Rabul. And then moving back over here to Rabul, and I'll zoom back out. And then of course moving over here from Rabul again, I'll go ahead and start counting out, which, there's Rabul, I'll start counting out their ability to move now since it's a normal launch it was in the yellow range then everybody will get to move half of their movement factors here so the 25 I'll do them first because they're I am I'm gonna send them over there to um, Port Mosbury to blast that place there so the Nels have a movement factor of eight so they'll be able to move four 
So one, two, three, and four. And then the Mavises, knowing of course that more than likely the U.S. carrier forces are going to be down here someplace, they'll move and get half their movement factor, which is also eight. So I'm going to send them down one, two, three, and four. And then one, two, three, and four. So, and then there's no combat to do. So Rabul's turn is over. And then I reach in the cup again. And I pull my next chit, which is and would be activated next the PM, Port Mosbury. One there. So. Alright, so that's kind of just a little preview of how I'm trying to make this work. Uh, if you have any feedback or comments, um, that's great. You know, go ahead and leave it in the comments section because this is a work in progress. I'm trying to make this work as a solo one. And then what I'm going to do here is when things start to get um, activated here, um, or start to get the action starts to build, I'll go ahead and um, come back and film some of that. Now as you can see here, these real light green ones here, these are intelligence levels. So there's an intelligence level 2 and an intelligence level 1 um, that I have already posted here. Um, the Shoho Forest, I think it's there. And then over here, well, they know there's some ships there. And I have uh, a chart to, uh, to do the Japanese decision making, whether they actually launch the carrier strike, if it's within range, those kind of things too. And again, pulling back... Um, at night, you know, making the range shorter as you get closer to sunset, because landing planes on carriers was kind of a dicey business at this point. And then, of course, uh, in the morning, also shortening the range because, you know, that same thing. You haven't quite got your scout planes out as far uh, as you would have them when everybody's kind of flying. And um, in theory, this did not always happen, but in theory, kind of overlapping things there as well, too. And I have modifiers for land-based air because land-based air... From what I've read, land-based air was not usually as accurate as the carrier um, pilots, which makes sense because, because yeah, of course the carrier pilots would have more experience identifying ships. So that's kind of the intro to give you an idea what I'm doing here with it, with the system, and going to see if I can make this work as a viable solo option. So this has been. The intro to the soul of Arian I'm working on from Tim Korchner from Bare Bones Wargaming saying thanks for watching and I'll come back with another episode whenever I get into the thick of combat here uh, and start to really get my search planes moving out here in the next turn or two when the range increases. Um, and I'll take you through some of the action cycle uh, chip pull things. So thanks for watching. See you then.